Hello, everyone. Hello, 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 hello. What is up? What is up? What is up? How is everyone doing today? I am doing fine. Holding it together as best as I can. So, um, I want to welcome everyone to Let's Talk Sunday. Um, been having a little difficulty today but um, i'm going to try to do make it do what it do baby hey make it do what it do all right um okay i hope i got enough battery life for this okay let's see Yep, so I wanted to have a Let's Talk Sunday segment, and you know, I, you know, my name is Sharice Johnson Moore, and I am here to, um, let's see how does this work. Um, let me see if I can find out. Okay, <clears throat> let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. What's that? Okay. All right, so um, like I said, my name is Sharice Johnson Moore, and I am the owner of Sharice Johnson Moore LLC, where I help entrepreneurs, I help entrepreneurs gain exposure through uh, uh, through advertising, broadcasting, publishing, and marketing. And I want to say hello to everyone that is in the place to be. What is up? What is up? What is up? And um, Let's Talk Sunday is a segment where I created for, for all to come talk about the topics that mean the most to them, to, to my viewers, to uh, all those that have, uh, you know, that they have organizations of uh, Then they have organizations that, um, hold on, hold on. Do, do, do. Mm. I don't. Yeah. 
it won't let me send the invitation again. I don't know why it won't let me send the invitation again. Um, I don't want, okay. I don't know what's up with that. Today has not been a good day for me. Um, I'm trying. Don't know what is going on with this. They keep saying the watch. Hey, Sarah. How you doing today? Hey, what's up? How are y'all doing today? Welcome to Let's Talk Sunday. And today we have a special guest. Her name is Ladidra Penn. And Ladidra is one of my co-authors for Stand Up Volume 3. Resilient Black. Black women who are shaping the world with their faith, uh, volume three. Uh, the book comes out in April. And I'm so happy to be, um, to know this woman of God. And um, today her topic is about, <clears throat> today her topic is about um suicide in the African American community. What? Okay. I don't know. Okay, so African American community. Um today is a really trying day day for me and I'm trying to hang in there today. Cause the end internet and everything is acting funny and I don't I just don't know I don't know anymore y'all I'm tired of working myself to death and nothing's happening um hey it's an invite I don't know how many times I gotta keep doing that um I'm going to just wait and see what happened. Because my stream yard didn't want to act right this morning. and I'm, I'm trying here. So what y'all been up to? Sarah, what you been up to? Sarah. Hey, Sarah. How you doing, Sarah? Thank you for joining me, Sarah. I greatly appreciate you. I don't know. Do, do, do. Okay. Well, I'm going to just give you some background on my guests. Because, okay, this was um, Miss Ladidra. Ladidra, Ladidra Penn. She is an inspiring author, a motivational speaker, certified human resources professional, owner of Diva, a Diva's Jewels, director with Paparazzi Accessories, and Better Together LLC. She provides speaking and HR consulting services to various business sizes. She has made great appearances on, guest appearances on television and podcast shows. Ladidra's calling is to help people to recognize the divine order and traumas, to live a thriving life. Um, her main focus is to bring attention to suicide in communities of color and to help suicide loss survivors heal through their grief process. She also helps to teach about manifesting and affirming your desired reality with faith. The Deidre resides in Memphis, Tennessee with Mr. Cooper, her fur baby, her cat. And she enjoys traveling, reading, and meditating. Uh, she can be reached 
for speaking engagements by email at 1 p.m. 1 at me.com. That's 1, number 1, P-N, P-E-N-N, 1, number 1, at me.com. So um, that is our guest for today. Day and I'm going to see if I can send another invite. I don't know what, what's going on with this. I, I You have to accept the invitation. Hey, Hello. Ms. Can you, you doing? hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Turn your phone up, honey. Wait a minute. Let me see if you can hear me. Um, you don't have a stand to put your phone on? I do, but it. I wasn't prepared to go on my phone. I was prepare for my laptop so we're good okay. can, can you hear me no. you can't hear me right oh no, turn your phone up do you yeah it's all the way up okay all right so i have um <clears throat> so how you doing today miss ladidra i am good how you doing today just in spite of <laughs> yeah in spite of i, I let me see so okay well i don't i don't want to mess with nothing and then mess something up <laughs> i don't oh all right well so how have you been doing today dear i am good looking forward to this okay all right all right all right so like I said, we're gonna. I'm gonna go. <laughs> and it says, Miss Ladidra Penn is an aspiring author. Uh, she is a co-author with me on uh, in the anthology book uh, being produced by Miss uh, Ardene Garner. And the title of the book is Resilient Black Women Who Are Shaping Their Faith, uh, Shaping Their Faith. Uh, shaping the world with their faith. Mm -hmm. uh, stand up volume three. Right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, motivational speaker, certified human resources professional, owner of D a do a diva's jewels. She's director of director with paparazzi re, paparazzi accessories, and better together LLC. She provides speaking and HR, human resources consulting services, to various business sizes. She has made guest appearances on uh, uh, television and podcast shows. Ms. Ladidra's calling is to help people to recognize the divine order and traumas to live a thriving life. Her main focus is to bring attention to suicide in communities of color and to help suicide loss survivors heal through their grief process. She also helps to teach about manifesting and affirming your desired reality with faith. Ms. Ladidra resides in Memphis, Tennessee uh, with Mr. Cooper, who is her fur baby. <laughs> and uh, she enjoys traveling, reading, and meditating. She can be reached for speaking engagements through her email, one pen one at me dot com. That is one is the letter one as the number one pen p e n n. No, it's l l pen l pen l pen. Okay, l pen one at me dot com. Um. And uh, she can be reached through that email address, lpn1 at me.com. So our topic for today is suicide in the African-American community. Uh, Ms. Ladidra, can you give us your story? Um, yes, I can. Um, come April of this year, I will be 10 years um, suicide loss survivor. I lost my only son 10 years ago, um, death by suicide. And it's very important that we say that 
I know we're in the habit of saying people commit suicide um, and things like that, but that's not the proper terminology due to the fact that, that we don't say when a person died from a heart attack that they committed a heart attack or they committed. Committed just has such a negative overtone, especially to suicide loss survivors like myself. So we like to correct people and say it's death by suicide because that's what happened. Grant, it was death by suicide. Um, April 14th, 2014, he was 18 years old, freshman at University of Memphis. And Grant didn't leave me a note. The human side of me would have wanted a note or was looking for a note, but he didn't leave me a note. And during the process of my grieving, um, back to that day, my mother is the first black female police officer hired here in Memphis. And Grant used her gun. Um, my father is an educator. He was an educator. Um, and meaning he um, principal at schools, a teacher, educator like that. And he started off the, the, the events of that day. Um, he suffered at that time when he was here from Parkinson. So at four o'clock every day, he would like to watch Judge Judy. And then on this particular day, the nurse did not, not leave his um, remote control where he could reach it. So he has had a med alert and he pressed the button and it called me. And he just said, could you ask Grant to come and pass me the remote? My nurse left and didn't leave the remote because he wanted to watch Judge Judy at four o'clock. So I called Grant and he didn't answer and I called my mother. Um, and I told my father, Grant was staying on campus at that time. I said, he might not come home after class, but he did. And so I tried Grant and my mother, he didn't answer. And I called my mother and she said, yeah, Grant just walked right past me and went upstairs. And the next phone call I received was that it was an emergency and that I needed to get home. And my mother called me and said, Grant was hurt. And when I look back on that day, um, everyone played a strategic role that day. Everyone, you couldn't have placed everyone. It was just perfect. It was perfect how everyone was placed at that time. For my mother to become a police officer in 1963, God fast forward knew this was going to happen. For my father to decide to be an educator, God knew this was going to happen. And he placed everyone there because I feel in, in my beliefs that he knew I wasn't strong enough to find Grant. And that if the normal course of events would have been, I would have come home, walked past Grant's room because I would have saw his car in the driveway and opened the door in his bedroom and I would have found him. But God spared me of that. And he put other people in place to start at those events. And that particular day changed my life. I would never be the old Latidra before April 14, 2014 at 4 p.m. I would never, ever be that person again. And I decided at that point, once I went through my grieving process and watching those around me and Cherise, I intentionally wanted to remember everything. Um, that particular day, I said to myself, remember what you have on, remember the weather, remember what you smell and remember the feeling, remember as much as you can about those around you, but more about myself. I wanted to remember the smell, the sound, what I had on, how the weather was and everything, because I knew as I progressed this grief, I was going to have to go back there. I knew that without a doubt that I was going to have to go back there. So that day, um, throughout the, that evening, everything happens like you see on television. The white band comes up. And due to the fact that my mother um, bent down and picked up the gun, they had to make sure it wasn't any foul play. So that added time. De detectives had to come out. Um, they had to come out and do pictures and all these things and separate us and all this stuff that, like you see on television. And so during the process, um, Grant died on a Monday. That Saturday, I had his funeral. That Sunday was Easter. So all of his friends was home from college during that weekend. And I look back on that and, and his funeral, I didn't want it to be a sad funeral. Um, people had prepared me because I never thought of suicide. You, you, now that I'm on this side of it, people seem to put people in a box. They seem to say, okay, if you have this symptom, blah, 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 then you're probably prone for suicide. And that's not true. Um, Grant did not exhibit any of the signs that you normally read about. There was no depression, um, anything like that, that I could see. I played that day back in my head over and over and over again. And the way I 
I di digest that, let me say, was it wasn't about me. It had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with me. Whatever decision or whatever he was battling with, whatever was on his mind that day, whatever was on his mind a couple of weeks before, a month before, I was not privy to that information. Mm -hmm. I did not know anything about that information. I didn't even know. And so it's important that I get that message out that we need to stop looking at the boxes and I and I I'm, and, and look beyond the boxes look beyond the descriptions that um, scientists or scientists or doctors have said that when a person is this they're suicidal that could be true but we also have to have a bigger scope and being in being a member of the african-american community we don't talk about it we don't talk about it it's like it's a hidden secret that's back in the closet that nobody wants to talk about nobody wants to dig up and so people are are afraid of it. And I think my ministry is more on this side of it than nor than prevention because I want to help people that's that have been where I am because they can get so other people can get a better understanding of how they're feeling. Um, I worked with a young man where his mother died by suicide, and everybody in the office was saying they would they wanted the company wanted to send flowers. And they wanted to know where the funeral was going to be. And he didn't release it. And they was like, Deidre, what do we do? What do we do? And I said, don't say anything. I said, because some people associate suicide with embarrassment. And I said, having a funeral in, the, in, the, in a church or in that natural setting that we're used to can can expose the family members to the questions, can expose the family members to the looks, can expose the family members to the remarks. And you haven't had time to digest what this family member has done. Yeah. So I can see it being at a funeral home or I can see a person keeping it private only to a family because there is a resonant of embarrassment. There is something that says, what made you miss it? How did you miss this? Why did this person do this? I can't tell you how many questions that I received um, from people, excuse me, from people, with, was he depressed and was he this? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. I'm a fighter. I, I have a mouth on me, uh, if I should say. And so some people warned me and said, you better get ready because people are going to ask you questions. I said, no, they're not. And then I had to gracefully ask God to protect me and, and guide my tongue because I didn't know how I was going to react to that because I was still digesting what, was hap what had happened to me. Mm -hmm. And so I share with people and I sit and tell them some people don't want to go through that because they're not strong enough at that particular time. Yeah. And I know some people who want to be there for their friends or loved ones or whatever and they just don't know what to do yeah. and, and 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 it's just and so i had to educate the people at work and say don't say anything to him he will tell his story when he's when it's time to tell his story yeah. and you get so sick and tired of repeating that story over and over again during that time period because people are intrigued especially in the black community because we don't talk about it yeah. suicide is a word that uh, we hear that every blue moon. You don't hear that as often. Now you hear it quite, it, it's, it's not anything, it wouldn't straighten yourself up to listen to a story if a person said they had someone or knew someone died by suicide. Because now it is coming to the surface. It's coming to the forefront, just like mental health, mental crisis, yes. uh, mental issues. It is a word we have to stop being afraid of it's a word that's not associated with a person that's being bullied it's it, we we seem so quick to see when i say um grant died by suicide was he bullied no he wasn't bullied it's like the human side of us have to grab on to something to make it right in our minds instead of saying no he wasn't that he wasn't depressed he was getting up going to school matter of fact that wednesday he was going to be inducted into the honor society he had already bought a ticket to do an assignment i don't know where it came from it is not my place to try to figure it out now the human me the human side of me wants to figure it out but the spiritual side of me surrender to the god that i know don't yes. put on me no more than i can bear so um that's that in a nutshell is my story i decided that what was i supposed to do with this Sharice? what why did god allow this to happen to me and he had to allow it to happen to me for a reason that was bigger than him 
that was bigger than Grant. Grant stayed here 18 years. He touched so many lives. I, I couldn't imagine. I was so shocked of so many lives he touched in the short 18 years. And he did his job because God decided to call him back home. So that's why I kind of go on this side of suicide. I support my brothers and my sisters uh, that are on the prevention side of suicide. I get it. And I said, but someone has to stand in the trenches because everybody is not going to get there in time. Everybody's not going to get the message out there in mm -hmm. time. Everybody's not going to get that phone number that you call out there in time. So someone has to stand on this side to receive those who've gone through it, who are suicide loss survivors, and give them a little bit of hope and tell them it's okay. Let's reach out there to the Brown community and let them know that this is an important topic that we need to talk about. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. It is an important topic. It is very important. Um. So my next question for you would be, do you see yourself starting a foundation for suicide survivors in your area? Oh, that's a good question, Cherise. Um, I have thought about it. Um, it has not been anything that's been at the top of my list. I, I found that a lot of people did that. Um, initially, after this happened to me, I um, got on the internet and was looking for support groups, and I found tons of support groups. And then I wanted to find something in Memphis. And the first group that I went to, no one looked like me. Um, and they were at a point in their grief to where they could tell their story just like they were talking about their day. And I wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to go to another support group and it was, it had more mothers and it had more parents in there. And I was still going through my grieving process. I still was trying to figure out what to do with all of this. And I could hear mothers who unfortunately had to watch their child take their life. And at that moment, a red light, a, a light bulb went off on me and said, oh my God, you still blessed me in this tragedy because you knew I wasn't strong enough to handle it. Mm -hmm. And then to watch other mothers and it just, it clicked in me that that's what I need to get out to the community. That's what I need pe people to realize. You still can have a blessing in a tragedy. You still could have a blessing in the tragedy. And anybody who have children, I don't care how old they are, it's something about a mother's voice that can stop them, either make them more better, but it's something about a mother's voice. We just know. We just know when something's wrong. We just know when they don't feel good. We just know certain things. Mm -hmm. And to be in a room with some mothers who could not stop their child from doing what they did, and mm -hmm. I said, God spared me. I said, so there has to be a blessing. I have to get that message out. And I know it's a lot of work until doing a foundation. And I'm not to that point yet because it's like I have to get out in the trenches. It's like I have to get out and let people know, hey. And that's why I share it at every opportunity when people bring stuff up. And I say, hey, you know, I lost a child. And it perks them up and makes them listen. And I sit and say it was death by suicide. And instantly, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, no, I'm not here to tell you that to get any type of um, any type of, of condolences or anything from you. I want you to listen to me. I want you to understand I didn't look like I was a grieving mother, did I? And they was like, no, you did not. I said, well, okay, then. Well, let's, I need to share my story with you so you can draw from my strength. And, and that's what I have to get out there. That's what I have to let people know. Um, that is, you still can thrive in a tra tragedy. Yes. You still can find the blessing. I was blessed to send Grant a text that morning that said, I love you. Okay. Yes. So yes. I was blessed to open up that door because that night he decided to spend a night at home. He did not go to his dorm and stay at his dorm. Okay. So I was blessed to open up his door and see him laying in his bed. Mm -hmm. So would I have wanted more? Yeah, the human side of me said, why you didn't walk in there and kiss him on the cheek? Why? Because it wasn't meant for me to do that. Mm -hmm. My story was to open that door or to send him a text that day and say, I love yeah. you. And whatever it did or whatever it served him at that moment, 
that's what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, how many people, how many people have you spoken to in the last week about this subject? Oh my gosh. Um, I was, it's seven days in a week. <laughs> And excuse me, it would I would have taken a sinus medicine, a tablet if I would have known, but that's okay. You know what? You know what? The spirit is going to say, you keep pushing. So forgive me for wiping my nose. I would have taken a sinus tablet if I would have known. But it's seven days in a week. I, I talk about this, I know, six to seven times. to recognize the opportunity to talk about it mm -hmm. at the right moment because sometimes it makes people feel sad yeah. and my and, and my um my reason is to talk about the strength yeah. is to talk about my strength and to sit and say to them if i can survive this you can survive what you're going through yeah. and so i have to sometimes um let people know that i am a suicide loss survivor so i talk about it quite often and then when people open up, at one point I thought suicide gravitated towards me because it was like, I, if somebody was sitting and say after I share with them, suicide, put them in touch with you. And that type of thing. So that's why I don't, um, I, I talk about it every opportunity that I get a chance to talk about it. And at the beginning, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's never an ending part of your grieving, but you learn how to live with it. I used to think, I was like, man, I know they think I'm crazy because I talk about it with such ease, but it took me a long time to get here. It took me a long time to stand on this side. And when you sit and ask God to give you strength and when God give you an assignment, you have to trust and believe he's going to remove all the fear from you. And he's going to give you the armor that you need. I message to get out of there. So, so true. And now you got to hold me together. You got to get me through this. And I know that this is bigger than me. And so, and then and I had to stop saying that because I was like, I know they think I'm crazy because I can talk about it with such ease. Yes, and then sometimes the human, human mind want to say, oh, she's so strong or she's so this. And I'll accept that too. But I still have my days as anybody would if they're grieving anyone. Um, but I just feel with it, it, I have to get this message out there and it's so important because, um, we don't talk about it. And sometimes it's because of our religion, because of our co-bear chance, you know, racism is in everything sometimes that African-American people deal with. It's also in suicide because sometimes it, it goes unnoted. Yeah. Sometimes it's not correctly noted. And mm -hmm. that's not fair to us. Um, and so, I and, and, and we don't think about mental health. African-American people are not given the fair chance of getting access to mental health like some others are. And, yeah. and the number one thing, sometimes we are embarrassed who my mother is, because my mother is still with us. And I immediately started going to grief. Too, or why don't you try it? Uh -oh. And you would have thought, I cursed her out. You would have thought, <laughs> I said a forbidden word because from her era, they don't, they don't do that. Yeah. They go to their ministry. Yeah. They go mm -hmm. to their mm -hmm. minister yeah. and they mm -hmm. pray. And it, and it was just, she was, and to this day, yeah. she, she just didn't want to do that. Yeah. But what came out of that was learning that she never talked about coming home, being the only black police officer. The therapist said, she took that just like she taken her job when she uh -huh. did her job and she, she just buried it. And so that's what she did with Grant because I asked her two years after Grant had passed, I said, how did you bend down and pick up that gun? Yeah. And the first thing she said, I had to save the victim. Not that I had to save my grandson. I had to save the victim. So even that, she switched back over to being a police officer, an enforcer, a public servant. Yes. 
and she did not see her grandson. She hey to ask for help. It's not an embarrassment yeah. to ask for help. And, and we have to learn that there are avenues out there that will help us. We just sometimes in the Brown community have to dig a little harder, have to mm -hmm. yell a little, have to bang down the little doors a little more yeah. uh, for people to pay attention to us and for us to realize um, what is going on with us and that we have mental health issues and we should have a right to help just like anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. So, so true. Um, uh, like I share in our morning group, in the clubhouse group, that my son deals with mental issues, deal, has mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying, you know, as a mother, it is a, it is a thing where you want to become overprotective mm -hmm. of your sons, you know, um, um, you know, I, you know how the men massage anything is. Oh no, you can't cling on to him, and you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to. You know, you babying him, and yeah. but they, you know, if how can I say this? When a child is growing up, it's very it's very important, you know, that the child has that mother motherly love because you don't feel motherly love and the father's not around it makes them feel lost mm -hmm. and it makes them feel withdrawn and why don't you know the questions like i when i was growing up why don't nobody love me don't nobody pay me no attention None, you know this all these questions going in the head regardless they're male or female uh my thing is what 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 you know when I, I was 16 i tried to commit suicide mm. when i was 16 years old and as i look back on that what what made me want to do that was i felt unloved and on and my opinion didn't count mm. and you know my parents they were all doing whatever they wanted but you living with older people my grandparents were older Right. And you know they don't talk. You know all, all the people they don't talk about everything. You know they don't talk. Right. They just tell you do 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 as I say. You know. Um. And the thing is, is sometimes what I look back on that now. I look back on that now. I try to implement implement ways that I listen and talk with him. I listen and, and have a conversation with him. Because when he was a child, because the state of mind I was in, uh, because the way my, my parents treated me, I treated my children like that. Well, no, I got time for you. Go sit down. You know, don't you got something else to do? And I brushed my kids off when they were growing up. But now I understand, look, they need somebody to listen, listen to them. Listen. I'll stop me. You, you want to talk to me? And I'll stop me. I'll stop everything what I'm doing and listen, what he has to say because i don't want him to feel ignored i don't want his i don't want him to feel like he's unwanted because he has expressed to me mama because you treated me like as a child you made me feel like i'm not wanted when i get when i come for the attention that i seek from you right. and that's what made me and i i be like okay now i make myself mindful of that that i'll stop what i'm doing we'll sit down and talk and we we now we talk for hours and hours and hours and I was like, I'ma just listen. I'ma just right. listen. Because when don't nobody it 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 makes them have self doubt with right. themselves. So, you know, and he has you know, he's expressed to me his problem with rejection mm -hmm. because I caused that in in him to be a a a on his sleeve like if i you know um you know well if i say patrick can you know you go do something else he'll feel that form of rejection because he feel like i'm pushing him away right but like, well, mommy has the work right now mommy got to do some work you know um and um
go off and be withdrawn. Mm -hmm. When you go off, when they go off and be withdrawn and they don't talk and they get real quiet, see what they doing. That's the that's the most thing I can I, I do with my son. It's like when they get quiet or withdrawn, I go in there and say, okay, well, what you thinking about? You know, you want to talk? You want you want to you know you want to watch some TV? Let's watch a movie because all these things I'm telling you, I didn't do with my kids. I right. didn't make time for them, and I think that's my fault why they turned off. Um, because. No, a parent is not around. It does affect the child. It is a, a tremendous effect on mindset, their upbringing, right. their how they see things in life, uh, things of that nature. Right. So, right. you know, that's that's how uh, I I do my son now. Um. So, um, what advice would you give a parent? What what's the one form of advice you would give a parent? Oh wow, that's a a good question. One form of advice would I give a parent? I would say, um, you know, a lot of parents think they should be their children's friend, um, even after they become a, not their friend. Yeah. Um, say to recognize your children, re recognize their uniqueness, mm -hmm. understand that they're brought up in a different era. Oh. That, we're, that we were brought up in. Yes. Um, understand their voice, see what their personality is, and understand that you contribute to that. Yeah. You contribute to that as well as the man contribute to that. Yeah. And help them empower them um, to, to be who they yeah. are and understand that, you know, what didn't kill them, that it makes them stronger. Mm -hmm. And understand and be able to say, I would I would say I guess the number one is to be able to receive what your children share with you. My mother waited very late to have children. You you couldn't or even in her she couldn't tell her parents how they treated her, how she felt about yeah. them. Because at some point it could have been a line of disrespect. But allow your children to tell you what their perception is of you yeah and if it's true it's true and if it's something you need to work on work on it yeah. it's okay to be vulnerable with your ch children because that was one of the things that was most uh one of the things i remember mm -hmm. is what you call like i call it as passing the baton yeah. yes. you, you grow up as your parents being super the human side of them yeah. and you like oh, you did that yeah. <laughs> you did this? Or, mm -hmm. you know and so it's like and then at some point you have to take care of them they get sick and you might have to take care of them yeah oh so it's 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 almost it's like understand that your children are human yeah. and understand that um you treat them as such and like mm -hmm. you said we grew up in an era you don't do my mother smoked and she was adamant when I went away to school. You better not start smoking, but you smoked everything. Now I couldn't say that to her. <laughs> when I grew up in an era where Grant could talk to me and he could say, "Hey, you know, I don't like what you got on, or why are you right. wearing that?" Yeah, or, uh -huh. you, Mama, you did this, and yeah. it, and it did. It would straighten me up some because it was I had to teach him about his delivery is how you say things. Amen. But I still owed him an explanation yeah. because he saw it and it was around. And and so I would tell parents, be able to receive what their perception is of you because they see and they you did things that you regret. You did things that wasn't good uh -huh. at sometimes the age that they're at, and it's okay. Yeah, and and just deal in them. Let them see that human side of you. Yeah, let them see it, and and not at the time. You know, I saw it at the time when my parents got filed for divorce, and I'm uh -huh. like, what was the divorce for? You know, and and learning all of these mm -hmm. things because quite the children are gonna go to the parent, the mother side. Yeah, and. 
learning all these things and I'm like, what? You know, yeah. I, we yeah. were all in it together. Uh -huh. But that uh -huh. and that it was a combination uh -huh. of you and that 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 man uh -huh. and it's some things you're not gonna like, it's yeah. some things that you like, uh -huh. but just try to guide them yeah. in the best way you can. And yeah. remember, we was one grade yeah. as well. Can you hold on for one minute, Mr. <laughs> yeah. Deidre? Hold on. Uh -huh. Okay, Miss Ladeidra, hold on for a minute. My phone wants to go dead on me. Okay. Miss Ladeidra, you here? Okay, I had to go get the cord from my phone because my phone wants to go dead. I don't think we want me talking me sentence be like, pew, you know, <laughs> pew, you know. Yeah, so... Thank you. Thank you for holding on. Um, yeah. Um, so tell us about your uh uh tell us about a diva's jewels. Well, Adiva's Jewels, I am a director of, um with the Diva's Jewels, which is paparazzi accessories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've been in it for three years now. February was my three-year anniversary. Um, I've taken a, a slight a sabbatical. Um, I don't come on live on Facebook anymore. So I'm thinking about going to TikTok. But every time when I get ready to throw in that towel, something happens. Either somebody plays an order or something. <laughs> or something <worse. laughs> right. So it's like, you know, I, I consciously go to prayer with everything. And mm -hmm. so I say, what i'm gonna surrender to this god you will let me know when it's time to put this five dollar jury up right. so i have surrendered to it and um building my store on TikTok. Mm -hmm. and i i don't take anything when people drop nuggets at me i take it and if i don't do anything with it right then and there it's in the back of my head because i'm like why did god allow them to say that to me what am i supposed mm -hmm. to do with that yeah and sometimes over think things and someone planted a, a seed in my head about why don't you go to TikTok? just go to TikTok and give it a try mm -hmm. and so i'm a firm believer of it, giving it my all that's probably one of my flaws that i i, I get i want to give it till i can't give it no yeah. more and, and god come down and said look come on now let it go i will let it go but it's it's like every single time when i say this is yeah. it i am done something happened I get an order or something yeah. happens. Uh, right. you know, pop -up shop. Just this morning, uh, one of the churches here sent me a link for a pop-up shop. Oh, okay. That's uh, and it's free. Mm -hmm. And so um, at least I'll be doing this, I know, until April. And I right. always have time when I go there. Mm -hmm. so that's a Jules, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, Better Together LLC. Um, what is uh, that company about? That is about me motivation of speaking. And originally it started out as Better Together Trucking Company. Um, I went and got certified to be a dispatcher and a broker. And I was going to get into the trucking as um, a little, little side hustle. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm, I believe in manifesting. And I write out my affirmations every six months. And one of my affirmations is I want to reach thousands. Yes. Um, to tell about my story. And that's where Ardene, Ardene reached out to me in April of last year. Wow, I, I reached out to her. Let me say, I, I saw one of her posts about this volume three book. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't know it was a book. 
that's why reading is fundamental. I never considered myself to be an author, never wanted to pursue it, never thought about it, anything like that. And, but here I am. And that opportunity, it's just God strategically put people in my life that um, wanted to hear my story, wanted to hear what's, what it's about because people are not talking about it or we don't come across a lot of people like me in your lifetime that talk about suicide as openly as I do. And, um, and so I had to sit back and resonate on that. And I was like, Deidre, you know, you feel that this God has given you an assignment. This is something you have to do. Um, because I just have to bring it, you, you know, if you were brought up by my dear, uh, a grandmama or something, you always had a, a room in the back of the house. And either in that room was a family member that was either sick in a hospital bed or a family member, the family just didn't want everybody to deal with. And so they housed back in the in the, in the, in the back of the room. In the in back of the room. Room in the dark. Yep, yep, with the, yep, yeah. And that's part of our culture, African-American people. And it's been a part of my culture, let me yes. say that. Yes, and That's where I feel um, suicide is. That's where I feel it's such a taboo in our community. And mm -hmm. I have to be the soldier and join the troops. And there's many other people out there besides me that's doing this. More than I do my research, I, I find people like, oh, my God, there are other people that's doing this. And um, I have to bring it out from at least crack the door open, yeah. at least oh. invite in every now and yeah. then yes. and say this is what this is about. And if, if anything else to um, provide support or just a listening ear to people that's on this side because when i hear about um this i always think of the person that has to deal with it when i th i always think about it, and i was like gosh they're gonna go through this and this and this and this and this this is what's getting ready to happen this is what they're gonna feel blah 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 and it just it replays in my head uh -huh. and if nothing but to be a support system for someone who has to walk through that door yes um that's what it'd be um it's a lot of people that's standing outside the door that's trying to prevent people from walking in the mm -hmm. door but some get through some get through and so to help people not to be afraid um to tell people that it's okay and 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 sometimes my most challenging people are very very religious mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and because they feel you know through this whole thing i never ever ever turned against God. I never did that. Yeah. I don't know why. I'm not saying nobody else is because everybody else go through their own grieving process. But I never asked, why did you allow this to happen to me, yeah. God? Yeah. I never asked that. My question was, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah. What am I supposed to do with this? You think I'm this strong where I can handle this? And, and looking at it from a different perspective mm -hmm. and almost having remove myself because I was a character of this show. I was a character as well. So removing myself and starting from the beginning of that day all the way down to the end and looking at it from a perspective, I'm sitting in front of a television watching a show mm -hmm. and looking for the blessing that God allowed everyone to play their role. Yeah. So if I can get one or two or three or four mm -hmm. or five people yes, like that, who's joining me now in this room of suicide, it helps a little bit with your process. Yes. It helps a little bit with your grief. If you change your mindset, just a tad bit. And, and why I say the most religious people, the religious people that I, I have ran into that are suicide loss survivors, mm -hmm. cringe when you say that to them because it's some, they haven't um, accepted it. They don't want to feel ashamed. They don't want to feel, um, they don't want people whispering and talking about them. They don't, they want to feel like they did something wrong or they missed something. And, and I have to go back and I have to challenge them and say, where's your faith? Where's your faith? I was told as a child, grew up Baptist, mm -hmm. he puts on you no and bear. Mm -hmm. So where did all that go? Why are you letting go to something that you hold so value to your life and to your heart? Amen. And why are you not 
applying that to this yeah i know it hurts yes i know it hurts i know the unbearable pain but still where is your faith mm. and feel that everything happens in divine order yeah so why can't we grip up to that and let that be our life our life boat yeah. or our life jacket mm -hmm. grab up to that yeah. and let that bring you back up to the to the top and be determined just to change the way you look and don't worry about everybody else we don't yo, worry about yo. i can't see how many people whispered how many people said anything mm -hmm. um it have boundaries just don't let me hear about it <laughs> don't yeah. let me hear about it. um i had some people who crossed lines that's why i'm able to talk on this side of it and i asked god to gracefully mm -hmm. gracefully guard my tongue because even those people i had to prove to them and show them something yeah. and and challenge them on some things and say mm -hmm. you know god didn't turn his back on me so why are you judging me why are you acting like this god yeah. didn't do that so it's like yeah. that's why most challenging people are sometimes the most religious people because i have to remind them mm -hmm. and i've had to say out you know we had one little trend we went through what would jesus do and i sometimes had to tell people what would jesus do you're not even acting like jesus so what don't come to me with that don't come <laughs> right with that. right because right regardless of the point yeah. regardless and some people have said to me you look at it like this because that's the way you deal with it so what god allowed me to think it he allowed me to survive it he allowed me to, to carry the message so that's what i'm going to do yeah. and if that's the way you perceive it that's fine yeah. but i still feel yeah. that things that happen in my life i don't care what it is even if it's bigger than suicide mm -hmm. i don't care what it yeah. if you change your mindset just a moment yeah. and 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 understand yeah. and especially if you are a religious person and understand uh -huh. god still even though something happened in your life that uh -huh. hurts you that caused you pain yeah. and it probably changed you and you have to look and say what am i supposed to yeah. get out of this yeah. what it what is this doing what am i supposed to do with yeah. this and and, and try to deep down and when i tell you when you waddle in something some people some people have called me and somebody is you know have passed and like did you what i'm supposed to do because nobody ever know what to say as old as we are and many people that we know have passed and we yeah. all don't know what to say don't say nothing just don't say nothing if you're gonna take food take food don't say anything because there's nothing you can say to bring the person back let no, them person not. Walk you know I, it, that pain. yeah i know and, you know I, I i've i've dealt with that when it came to death of my grandmother my grandmother and then my uh, father and then my mother you know they all behind each other and I was sitting, I remember sitting at my father's funeral and I asked, Lord, what are you trying to teach me with this? What was this about, Lord? You know, and um, then I really got the message what God was trying to tell me with the six months later when my mother died. Mm. I was sitting at her funeral and I was sitting there, you know, I had my breakdown moment. That's, you know, you view the body the night before the funeral. Right. But that next day, it was like I was in a like a like a la la land, like la la, you know. And I was sitting on the pew. My brother was the old brother was talking, and I heard the voice of the Lord say, "Now, now it is time for you to write your book." I'm sitting there looking around, you know, like, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> anybody else hear that? Um. I said it, you know, to myself. So I was in there. My sister said, you all right? I said, I'm fine. She's sitting right here beside me. Right here. And then I heard the voice again say, now it's time for you to write your book. And I'm like, man, you know, I said, I said that out loud, man. <laughs> My sister <laughs> said, you talking to me? I said, no, baby. No, <laughs> no, no, right. So I uh, was in there a few more minutes and the voice Clearly said it again, say, now it's time for you to write your book. I said, okay, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do. My sister said, is you talking to me? I said, no, child, I'm saying talking to the Lord because he just gave me a message. So she was like, hmm, 
You know, um, you know, death, uh, death is not, I had to relook at death. I had to reevaluate death. And those three deaths catapulted me to become the person God wanted me to be. Right. Not, you know, um, how could I say this? I was the most coolest, calmest person when my grandma died. Like my grandma was really my mother. Mm -hmm. And I was the coolest, calmest person. And, you know, and people saying things to me and, and they was off the wall stuff. And I'm sitting there like the Lord said, he cleaved my tongue a lot of times to not embarrass people and tell them what their son did to me growing up. I had to clean my head. Like, no, you didn't want to be disrespectful to old people, you know, you, right. they older. So I always had respect, you know. Um, but God changed me into a different person with those three deaths. And not, it, <laughs> I looked at death, I, I look, I, I, how could I say, I've experienced it as a little kid with my great grandmother, my grandfather, cousins and all them, you know, but it's different when he hit home. Right. It's different. My granny, okay, yeah, okay, I dealt with that. Great grandma, okay. And then my grandmother's brother, okay, that's cool, you know, and I'm like, oh, all right, you know, it just, I, I just thought it's something that everybody do, everybody die, okay? But, right. Then when you get to the people that really mean something to you, it's like, hmm, you kind of, God gives you time to evaluate your feelings. Right. right. He gives you time to evaluate what you're going to say, is you going to say it, how you going to say it. And then sometimes you be like, it ain't even worth saying that. You know, and, and, and he gives you time to process what's happening the process is what changes you the process of how he presents stuff to you is another thing too and you be like you know um, um my mother you know i gonna say this little story my mother passed and my baby sister and one of my older brothers got into an argument over some over her insurance policy. And I'm sitting there like, really? It ain't even about that. It's not really about that. You know, because we I had to, you know, my anyway, my baby sister had a had a gripe against my brother that got the money. And I was like, child, it's called you supposed to have your own insurance on mama. I just came out and said it. You're supposed to have your own insurance on her. Not just worrying about somebody else going to give you some money from her dad, but you're supposed to have money from yourself for yourself. And she was looking at me like, no, 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 no. I said, I ain't even trying to hear all that. I said what I had to say. I'm going to leave it at that. And if, if that's how you feel, that's you. But I know what I know. Okay. Um, But it gives you clarity. Death gives you clarity. And it also opens your mindset to other people's thinking, right? Because you see, you see a you see a different side of people. Um, you see a different side of people that you did not realize. Mm -mm. And sometimes, you know, a death can bring you together or it can break you up, yeah. one or the other. And, yeah, and, and it, mm -hmm. it brings to the surface either topics that you haven't failed to talk uh -huh. about, you neglected during the week, yeah. or. Um, um, and it brings to surface things that you, you've buried that mm. you don't want to talk mm. about. Yeah. That's yeah. the point. Like what you're saying mm -hmm. that if I can get people to look at their tragedy like that yeah. and say, what am I talking about now? Yeah. What is, how is it making me feel mm. now? Why did mm. I not speak about that when mama was alive? Yeah. Why didn't I talk about this with my siblings when yeah. she was alive or when my dad was mm. alive? And, and that's like the that's the end and it's like there is another blessing that now unfortunately this death have brought you on one yeah. accord yeah. fortunately death is a blessing mm -hmm. that is brought this topic back up to the surface yeah sometimes it's going to be painful things yeah. sometimes it'll be i remember when you did this to me and i didn't like it mm -hmm. or i remember when you lied to me and, mm -hmm. and sometimes things but yet and still yeah. It's like 
that death still brought it together. Yeah. It still brought it together. Yeah. It brought things up. Mm -hmm. Just by changing mindset just a little bit, yeah. it kind of helped sometimes to learn how to grieve that person a little yeah. bit better. It, yeah. It, yeah. But, uh, you know, from my mother's, excuse me, from my mother's death, it brought all of us together. We had never been in the same room together growing up. Oh, wow. We how, many, we, how many of it's like um, my mother had five children before me. Okay. And then my baby sister, you know, uh, baby sister, you know. So and then um, two of my older siblings, they they've passed on. Okay. But I still got the oldest oldest brother. You know, and they did, you know, my sister that was born before me, I have her and the one after me, and my brother that was born before, or the sister before me. <laughs> so that's we, you know, um, and and it's a, it's a thing of we've never been in the same room together until her funeral. Never. Wow. Never together until that moment. And I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, but you, but the thing is, if, if we were together, that was the main, that was the main, that was what made me happy that right. we were together, regardless of mama passed. But sometimes, you know, how, you know, some people don't want to let go. They don't, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to, uh, they, they can't they can't process the death of mother because now they want to strike out at everybody. Now they want to be gone away from everybody. Everybody together, you want to go off somewhere else. Um, excuse me, but we got company, you know. And, and Cerise, you know what? And I hear a lot of that all the time, especially among siblings. It's just my brother and I. And, I, you know, some people will sit and say, you know, they weren't there. They didn't go to the hospital. They didn't do this and they didn't do that. And they didn't come and see the person or yeah. they didn't do that. And we have to understand that a person can only do what they can yeah. do. And I tell people, I said, try not to land on the negative part of that because we only can do what we can do. Um, some people will put here on this earth where they can and making a lot of money um, having a funeral home. They can be around yeah. dead people. I can't do that. I, I can't do that. Um, I don't like hospitals. I can't tell you how many times before I walk into a hospital, I ask God to God mm -hmm. to give me, do what I need to do. And yeah. so I tell people, I said, everybody has a role. To play. That's not Amen. their role. They Amen. can't. And why, why would you want this person to do yeah. something they're physical or mentally yeah. incapable of yeah. doing? And sometimes we have to stand strong mm -hmm. for others. Yeah. When people get sick, a lot of people yeah. are revealed. Yes. And your siblings who said, oh, they didn't do this and they didn't do this. I said, well, maybe they couldn't do it. Have you thought yeah. about it's planning with something negative? Yeah. Maybe they physically or emotionally could not do it. Yeah. And it is human nature for us mm -hmm. to protect ourselves. It's Bernie, we're going to get away. If something we don't feel good, we go take medicine. It's mm -hmm. human nature for us to protect yeah, us. Man. So why is that uh, instead of allowing our mind to go mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. that this person could do this or could do this or this person did do it, mm -hmm. maybe they could do it. And it was your role. You was the blessed one out of all the siblings. you know. And I sit and tell them, you was the blessed one yeah. to be the strong one. You was the blessed one because... I know some some siblings who step up to the plate and they can do it like no other. Yeah. And then and I said that was your role. You was that was that was your role yeah. when this time came because everyone has, has a divine order, the divine time. Amen. And and then sometimes we have to learn because sometimes you know you have the sibling and usually nine out of ten is the baby. Yeah. The baby is just it resonates different with the baby. It's yeah. like mama protect the baby. More so yeah. than anybody else, yeah. and it's okay. Amen. You know, and it's okay. Yeah. So it's, it's it's you know it's like I want to tell people um, inhale, exhale. It is what it is, and some people don't like when I say that. It is what it is because sometimes if we will surrender instead of fighting, uh -huh. 
and render and just sit and say, you know what, you the way you are, and I don't agree with it, but it ain't nothing I can do. Right, <laughs> There's nothing right, I can right, do. Right, you know, right. So what it's going to be and just Amen. keep it pushing. Keep it moving. You know, because <laughs> just keep it moving. Yeah, just keep it moving because nine out of ten, that person showed you who they was long before that incident happened Pretty. anyway. So but, why are you up to being saying, consistent? They're right. consistent. They is who they, they is. So, it's like if why are right, why you expect this event to be any different than any other event because yeah. that's just how they work. and yeah. and so, uh-huh. you know yes. we will be a lot if we ex- we will accept people where they, they are right. now sometimes you keep them where they are mm-hmm. because that's where I am yeah, right <laughs> right okay too uh-huh. yes Miss Ladidro okay. yes Miss Ladidro I know that's right so. Um, do you have any uh announcements or, or anything you want to give us before we go out? Book is coming out in April. I am so excited about that. The um stand up volume three revival is in October in Charlotte. Oh my god, I am so excited about mm. that. Mm. It's like I'm on this side of it, and I'm like, what is next? What does God have in store right. next? You know? Right, right. Imagine this time last year, mm-hmm. never imagined I would have written a chapter. This time last year, never imagined I would be moderating a room on Clubhouse. Amen. This time, I never imagined I would have the opportunity to receive an invite from you. Amen. So, <laughs> I welcome it all. I am welcome it all. And I can't wait for the next. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, wait to see what's happening next um god is not allowing me to let go of a diva's jewels and what i'm saying is what am i supposed to do what am i supposed yeah. to do with it and i receive it i receive whatever the assignment is i am mm-hmm. taking um better together llc a motivational speaker uh-huh. i got to get suicide out there i got to get us talking about suicide not to be afraid uh-huh. of talking about suicide I let us receive everyone who is suffering yes. from and don't know how to deal Amen. with it on this side. So that's what my next is. Mm. I can't wait to share. I appreciate you sending me the invite to be a part of your on fire. You are a phenomenal. I mean, gosh, you do this with such ease. You sit up here and say, you just so calm about it. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? I've been on pins and needles all morning, but you are so calm about it. So I appreciate um, you inviting me here and allowing me to speak. I really do. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You know, you, you, um, you, you know, we girls, you know, we girls, you know, we, we <laughs> home girls. Okay. So, you know, and that's the, that's why we do. It. That's, that's how, that's how we do in our Brazilian black women group, you know? So, um, I greatly appreciate you coming. I greatly appreciate, uh, we, 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 we will be seeing each other in October. Okay. That's right. All right, and we're gonna be seeing each other in April too. So, you know, uh, you know, we we have that sisterhood, and I greatly appreciate you, Miss Ladidra, and I greatly uh say, um, uh, I know you're gonna have a blessed day, and you too. I know that I love you, and I will talk to you later, my dear. Okay, so much, and I love you too. Thank you for being you and inspiring me thank you so much well, you, i appreciate you you're welcome all right okay you said okay all right bye-bye all right, bye-bye